Good evening, everybody. How are you? Hi, happy Monday. It looks like uh, people want to talk about housing. Yes. We want to learn about housing. We want to share about housing. It's on our mind. It's on, you know, on every morning when we get up, it's uh, in the news. In our pocketbook, all those things, right? So we want to get a better handle on it. That's really what what the night is about. Um, so my name is Matt Huerta, and I'm the housing program manager with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Uh, we're very pleased to, to be co-hosting this event with uh, several parties, several partners, and um, we'll learn more about it in, in, in a few minutes. Those of you that just what is that? What is that? But I have here. Uh, John uh, Wizard, who's my, my local resident kind of advisor person who's been uh, really helping me along this part of our, how we do our work is we, we really want to make sure to partner with folks that, that are, are very well uh, established in the community and, and know how to connect us to other voices and resources. So he's joining me uh, to help deliver some of his presentations and to, to have this, this kind of a facilitated discussion. Okay, we don't really, it's not uh, fully baked. Uh, there's definitely going to be an opportunity to, to engage each other a little bit and, and to hopefully at the end of tonight we have uh, the beginnings of, of a strategy of, of some of the, where is the energy going in terms of not only this room but, but folks outside of the room that uh, you know can't, couldn't make it tonight. Um, we're thinking about them and thinking about what are the next steps that we can take to really make a difference uh, in Seaside and across our region. Um, so before I move forward, I really want to highlight a few uh, individuals here that are with us tonight. So uh, Senator uh, State Bonding is uh, not in the flesh, but uh, almost as we have Alex here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so so you probably, probably seeing him more often than the good senator, but uh, certainly he's here. And we have uh, Supervisor uh, Jane Parker joining us and co-hosting. Thank you. She'll have some words to share with us later. We have a couple council members, Kayla Jones and uh, Dave. <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, both of those entities, especially for, for uh, being partners of, of MBEP. And I also want to highlight that uh, we have a couple representatives from uh, the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. That's uh, uh, two trustees, Wendy uh, Ruth Askew and uh, <laughs> Here. There she is. Okay. Well, and anybody else want to be an elected official? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rudy Fisher is here. Oh, thank you for joining us this evening. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I thought she left me already. Huh? I didn't see you. All right. Thank you for staying with us. And um, yes. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so many other. Uh, Thank you uh, as we get go forward. So anyhow, we wanted to uh, bring to you, again, Housing 101, understanding our housing situation and working towards a solution. Um, so I don't know that I got a, 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 a Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, the men's bathroom is on the other side of the room to your left. Uh, and the women's bathroom is just straight down the hallway. If you walk through these double doors, straight back on your left-hand side. Um, and I just want to apologize in advance if you see me step out to cough or blow my nose or something, I caught a cold from my seven-year-old stepson, and uh, I figured if, if Pink can sing the song for the Super Bowl with the flu, I don't have an excuse for not being here. So uh, I apologize if I have to step out for just a second. I just don't appreciate that. We'll use that too in case we get stuck. So our agenda, just to, to recap, so we're going to have uh, very quick introductions, and may, maybe this, uh, this is again a capacity crowd, so we, I think that's really important to do that. Um, so we know who's in the room and establish that. We will do that in a second. Um, housing stories, just a few minutes. But that is the idea for that is to just share within a minute's time uh, with the neighbor what is top of mind in terms of your housing story. So I'll illustrate that in just a couple minutes. Um, we also want to um, have uh, seaside housing actions in process. So uh, it's an honor to have some city staff with us today. We have. Kurt uh, Obermeyer with us to give us uh, the rundown on some of the latest and greatest there. And then uh, I will demystify what the Modern Day Economic Partnership Housing Initiative is. And we'll also talk about the three A's for understanding housing. There will be a test later on what those three A's are, so be sure to pay attention there. We will not let anybody uh, stay too long on your phone unless you're taking notes, that's okay. 
Um, the ideas for collaboration and next steps, again, it's important that we end with uh, something that's clear in terms of, of next steps. This isn't the end, this is part of the beginning. This is, there's been lots of discussions around housing. We've probably attended some other forums and meetings, um, but this conversation will live on and we want to be able to capture that in the end. Thank you. So approved and pending actions in Seaside. I'd like to ask Kurt to come up to the front of the room, please. Oh, we're, we're doing this first. Yes. <laughs> Why not? Oh, yeah, you know what? You're right. Wait a minute. Wait, you got a head My apologies. So, my apologies. So, my apologies. So, introductions. That's important. I was like, Kurt, I want you to talk. Um, so, introductions first. Let's start on, on this side of the room, if you don't mind. And so, in, introduction is just name and your name, and if you want to share that you're a resident here and why you're here tonight. That's it. I'm Evangelist Bonstone. I'm the executive director of the 401 Environmental Justice Network, and I'm also a Catholic missionary, and I'm very interested in what's happening and how we do as a municipal. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sean Hebart. I'm the senior field rep for Carpenter's Local 605, which covers all of Monterey County, and we're in Marina right up the street. And I'm here to obviously just build my knowledge about seaside issues. Our members are stuck on both sides of this. We're building housing and we're Kurt Overmeyer, Economic Development, City of Seaside. Jane Barr, uh, Eugene Nelson. I'm Alex Pataro. I'm a field representative with the office of Senator Bill Monning. Wendy Askew. Jane Parker, County Supervisor. I've been working for several years to try to bring all the jurisdictions together to talk about, to identify locations for housing, identify, um, you know, partners and resources. So, really interested in this topic. Caitlin Jones, um, Councilwoman for Seaside. Jane Jones. Sherry Castillos, I'm Brian Stewart, as well as uh, Citizen of uh, the City of Marine. Alyssa Kaspersky, uh, resident of Seaside. Hutch, I'm a realtor, lawyer, socialist, live up the hill. <laughs> 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 Grandma Nolita. Hi, I'm Grandma Nolita. I'm a realtor, lawyer, I'm with Housing Choices, and I'm looking to learn more about the housing initiatives in our community. I'm with Foster Copa, um, the Unity Church um, of Monterey Bay, and also the chair for the Monterey um, Mental Health Commission. So we have uh, great concern for that subset relative to affordable housing. <laughs> I'm Jan Lindenthal, also with COPA and Unity of Monterey Bay, and we're, I'm here to learn. We're um, maybe looking to have a, a community farm like this in my city, Pacific Road, and so interested to see how this format works and, and bringing that to my city. I'm Juana Sinatera. I write a column. It's called Homeless in Paradise. It goes out to at least 5,000 people every week. And it covers this topic. Now I live in Seaside. Thank you for having me. A lot of miles, board president for Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. And our district has made our strong, concerted effort to bring teachers here. And we too often have been thwarted in our efforts because once they find out how much it costs to live here, they turn down the offer. So I'm here to see what ideas and opportunities there may be to turn that around. Mike DeLatho with Land Watch Monterey County. Affordable housing is one of our five guiding principles, and I'm excited to learn more about it tonight. Go next. I'm Don Murphy. I live in Pacific Grove, where I'm on the Planning Commission. I'm Karen Araujo. I live in Salinas, and I'm a member of the County of Monterey's Housing Advisory Committee. And goal for tonight is to participate in the good process and learn a lot. Thanks. Eddie Garcia, work with Senior Resources with uh, Episcopal Senior Communities. So I'm here just to see what type of initiatives are going into play to try to help those in need. Good morning, Mason. I'm a realtor with Sotheby's International of Realty. I live in Pacific Grove, and one of the reasons several of us are here 
from Pacific Grove is to see whether or not this process would be something that we could also bring into Pacific Grove. So thank you so much for being the people who are going to lead the way. And I think affordable housing is the issue for the entire area. And I'm delighted that this venue has been made available and that uh, we can all participate. Thank you. Sandra Gray, I'm the art program director for the city of Seaside, but I've always been a very busy and <laughs> retired teacher <laughs> uh, involved with the community. I live here at Seaside, I've been here since 1971, and I hope to see that something is done about the homeless situation in this whole county. Uh, my name is Luba Hara. I live here in Seaside, and uh, I'm uh, from the San Francisco Seven Church, Vira uh, Copa, and I'm here because there is over a thousand families in my my church that uh, were affected by this situation. So I'm here to learn and to do something about it because uh, we we really need it. Thank you. My name is Marion Boyd. My name is Mary Ann Buena, and I'm also a community of Monterey Bay and Copa. Um, we uh, have joined forces with uh, Lupi and her group, and uh, I've personally been interested in the homeless situation in housing, but um, I'm here to learn about it all and see where it takes me. Sue Roycewich, uh, Unity of Monterey Bay and Copa. Uh, I just think it's the responsibility of every city to have housing for all the people who make it work. And it's about time that we do something on it. I've been the pastor of the Monterey United Methodist Church since July 1st, and I've been interested in affordable housing every place I've lived on earth. Oh, I'm Rhonda Summerton. I'm just here supporting an affordable housing option that already exists in Monterey County and local home parks, but that's been taken away uh, because older units are being pushed out and just trying to make it. Thank you. Dorothy Summer joining her mother. Carol Moore, I'm here with Rhonda and Dorothy and we're working to try to keep um, affordable local homes from being phased out. I'm the Avery Seaside resident. I'm Avery Seaside resident. I'm the Avery Seaside resident. I'm the Avery Seaside resident. Chief Standard here of the Monterey County Planning Commission. I'm a friend of the board of the Nation of Monterey County and was also on Mr. Panetta's staff when we did the Board of Reviews plan that tried to strike a balance between 18,000 acres of open space, education, and as I recall, 6,200 units of new housing. Hi, I'm Angelica Johnson. I'm a public school teacher. I'm also a travel teacher, and being that I have lived abroad and I am used to affordable housing, considering that in my own hometown, there is no list. Where. I want to know how we can fix that. <coughs> My name is Anna Davidum, and I'm a mother. Um, I've been a resident of several cities here for the past seven years, trying to always find the next affordable place to live. Having to look at every single year, moving my children all the time, so I'm here to see, and hopefully this will change for other people as I'm doing better now. But I hope that I'm not having to move again. Uh, Dominic Dressa, Swiss Lines. My name is Tyler Williamson. I'm a candidate for City Council in Monterey. Uh, Tyler Baroldo, resident of Salinas, where I also work in the district office for our current congressman, Jimmy Panetta. Um, this is an issue that cuts to the heart of all the issues in our district. You can't have a conversation about economic opportunity in this district without somehow bringing on housing. It always comes back to housing. Um, in our district, we also have Santa Cruz County, which is dealing with very similar issues right now, if not even worse up there, um, in terms of the supply and the cost of housing. Um, it's an emergency there, it's an emergency here. Um, so, looking to get 
Lots of good information. Thank you. Don't tell, don't tell the congressman we forgot about him. I won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Chrissy Burwell. I live in Monterey. I pay a lot of rent. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm a Uh, Dustin Cook, I'm president of the local chapter of the National Association of Remodeling Industry, and uh, I'm here to get informed and see how we can get involved with the community that we work in. Helen Rucker, <clears throat> 50 plus year residents of the seaside, came here as an army wife and still here. <laughs> I've been on the city council and I've been on the school board, and I'm very happy that. Uh, there are people here from the other cities on the peninsula besides Seaside because I hope nobody believes that all of the low-cost housing ought to be in Seaside. <laughs> but thank you very much for making, for being here, for having a presentation like this because uh, housing and homelessness in particular is, is a big problem for all of us. Thank you. David Pacheco, Seaside City Council. Lynn Hamilton, longtime county resident, uh, retired teacher, very concerned about affordable housing. I see that in this lady, retired teacher also. I suggest I think we need to look at least look at maybe tearing down the barracks and four doors because there's infrastructure already there and maybe that might be a place to put some houses. <laughs> Amelia Bonilla, um, Monterey Bay Community Engagement, Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, I'm the Community Engagement Assistant, so I work with Matt. Thank you, Amelia, for doing everything that I forgot to do today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bernie Fisher, I'm on the City Council of Pacific Grove, and after a lot of years of nothing happening, we have interest in a couple of projects in town, and we want to make affordable housing part of those projects. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> There's some cameras here too. Brave, brave, brave man right there. You can clap for that, I think. Yeah. 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 Right here, Nick. Uh, my name is Douglas Belzer. I happen to be a soldier uh, fighting for uh, people's rights and so on. We have a, a bunch of uh, petitions for California. We care about you, California, and um, I hope that everybody will get to see me about all these different petitions that are coming out in there. And I also have a uh, company with a um, part-time uh, college university, a uh, coalition of young people becoming seniors. We've got to start doing something about our next generation before it's too late. It's not just the homeless now, but it's the people that are coming into there. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ashley Gower. I'm a resident of Pacific Grove. I'm a student at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies in Monterey. Um, and I'm a new part-time staff with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And so I'm extremely excited to learn more about the housing initiative. I'm on board with their uh, workforce development initiative. Um, and as a matter of fact, a lot of students don't end up enrolling into MIS because of housing issues. Good evening, my name is Glorietta Rowland. I am with the Monterey County Department of Social Services Community Action Partnership, and I am also a resident of Seaside. I've been interested and involved in the issue of affordable housing and homelessness for many years, so I'm very excited to see so many people here to address this topic and want to be a part of whatever solutions we can discuss. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. Um, I'm Jonas Rivero, and I am a community activist. No, well, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself, I'm actually, I wouldn't consider myself a community activist, but I am a community participant in many of these things. And I have, over the years that I've been here, I have seen the house, um, cost of housing go up and up and up, and nothing's being done about it. So I'm here to be informed and to see what I can do, both in my involvement and in my participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Esther, did we catch you? No. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Um, Esther Malkin, I'm a 15-year resident of Seaside and Monterey back and forth, and 
I'm mainly interested in getting some attention taken under the umbrella of affordable housing, but given over to workforce housing, um, whether it's teachers or students. I currently rent a room in my rented house to a Ms. student. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Um, <laughs> because there is such a problem you know, with housing. I mean, we have all these colleges here, and we want everybody to come here to school for school, but they don't have anywhere to live when they come here. So I'm currently working with uh, Matt on a couple of things that hopefully will help with Monterey, city of Monterey, but obviously it has to be more of a regional approach. But I think affordable housing has, um, the term, has become immune to a lot of um, politicians and people in the area, and we have to start getting a little more specific when we talk about affordable housing so that we can make things happen instead of use this umbrella term that just isn't generating enough interest anymore. Anybody else? Yeah, you got one right here, yeah. If I can tighten it. Um, yeah, uh, my name's uh, Wes White. I'm a Salinas resident, uh, president of Salinas Homeless Union. Uh, housing is really big for me. I, I wish we could include tents and whatever, you know, tiny homes, anything that's not on a permanent foundation as well as, as being included as affordable housing because honestly RVs, um, you know, we, we've got a major issue crisis of people who can't even afford to get into rent. So those people need to be accounted for as well. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna start moving forward because we really wanna get through the, the presentation as well. Um, you know, again, this is a facilitated discussion, so the, the slides are meant to, of course, educate folks and get folks on the, get some information out there, get on the same page, but we do wanna encourage folks to say, okay, um, making sure that we um, understand the information as well. Um, the other piece too to understand that the reason why we, we spend a little bit of time and, and investment here, so we're learning right now. You know, we're learning about what's going on in PG. We just heard about Monterey. You know, people are you know starting to think about this more regionally. You know, now you're you're at a meeting where you can qualify that, check that box where hey, it wasn't just about my community. It's a larger community. So there is stuff happening right now as part of this presentation. It's important to kind of take stock of. Um, the other piece around stories is that my experience, and I've been doing housing work for about 18 years now, started as an intern, project manager, development director, executive director of nonprofits, all in housing. I own my own company now, and I do a lot of consulting around the Bay Area and with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Um, my experience in engaging the community and having successful projects, it comes down to the stories. It comes down to the people that we're serving, the clients, the neighborhood leaders, the people that are impacted the most, that are the, the users and, and the, the folks that breathe life into these buildings, right? It's not you know, the developers and whether you're doing nonprofit work or market rate work, it's buildings. It's these cold terms and it's real estate, it's uh, finances, all these things and design, but when it comes down to it, it has to breathe life into it and we all, you all are the ones that breathe life into it. So just for a few minutes, we wanted to practice you know, and, and tell somebody in a minute's time, we're gonna try to try to do this, but in a minute's time, um, tell your quick housing story. Again, what's top of mind? Some of you kind of did that already, um, but turn to a neighbor and I'll illustrate. So my quick thing is the reason why I'm such an avid, avid, avid affordable housing fan and supporter and, and, and this is what I live and breathe is because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for subsidized housing. My parents started their family when they were 16 and 19 in the Central Valley. We think, you know, it's another level of poor in the Central Valley, okay? And so my folks um, were nearing homelessness when they started their family. And if it wasn't for affordable housing for the first five years of my life, who knows where I would have been. And I'm a Head Start kid. I'm all these the folks back in the early 80s decided to invest in all these programs. I'm a beneficiary of those programs. I'm standing here before you for that. And again, subsidized housing was the biggest element of that intervention. So I believe in it. It works. I'm proof of it. And so that's my housing story. John, you want to illustrate your housing story? So my housing story is uh, growing up in San Diego, which I understand is a little bit different from here. Um, I vividly remember sitting in my bedroom, hearing my parents have a conversation with our landlord, and him talking about how he was going to double the rent uh, just immediately. There was going to be no step increase or anything. 
So um, as an adult, I get to understand what that means more than as an eight-year-old. Um, but just how close we came to being homeless without me having any kind of understanding of that concept, anything I could do about it, uh, just a passive participant in that process. And the stress and the anxiety that my parents felt, um, knowing they had a, an eight-year-old son and a one-year-old son, and what they would do if they had to live in a car, what they would do if they had to find family members that to crash with because they couldn't afford rent. Um, those sorts of things have left an indelible mark on me and, and reminded me how privileged I am to have housing security now. And so working toward that in my role as a planning commissioner and as a member of our community, trying to ensure that that's something that everybody can enjoy because certainly I have enjoyed that privilege and um, I wouldn't in a heartbeat ever wish that somebody wouldn't get to know what housing security is because it is so vital to being productive in our society making sure that you have a roof over your head and somewhere safe to go home to every night. So we want to um, continue this for a few more minutes. So if you don't mind turning to somebody, preferably if you don't know them, but obviously it's Thank you. So thank you very much for sharing that. You know, we know that we all might just go like that. So what I want to do right now is just um, take maybe two two quick stories. One, uh, you know, something that's happening right now is Demo the demographics are really shifting, right? We all know and have heard about it in terms of the baby boomer generation. Senior housing is, is really, really something to track and be aware of and be supportive of. I think we need to hear about a senior housing story. Does anybody have one that they would like to share? I do. Right here. <coughs> Please. I have a senior housing story. It's not only seniors, but it's a senior housing story. Uh, you may not like the where I'm coming from, but uh, by way of the military, being here with the base closed and we found out that all the jobs were going away and, and people were going to be left out in the cold. Uh, there's a lot of seniors, uh, parents of students that are in school. Uh, they had had to leave the peninsula because there was no way they could afford to live in their housing because all the jobs had even left. And right now, the Section 8 program is dead because it takes years. And so you have a lot of young people that's running around homeless, as well as we can say all sorts of ages now because the parents don't have a job. The parents don't have a place to stay. So the children are uh, just loose and they don't know what to do. So the other problem is rent control. If we don't have a way to control how much rent people have to pay, even though the economy is bad and they have no way of getting a raise, if the people with the good jobs, God bless you, but most of the people don't have good jobs. Most of the people work in McDonald's and all those kinds of places and cannot afford to have a place to stay. In 2000, I think it was 2000, there was a million dollars given to this county um, to supposedly help with homelessness. I don't know where that money went, but I know that's probably not enough because we have a huge problem here in Monterey County. And we've been working very hard and traveling all over the state of California, talking to the local officials, and thank God for the people that put this on. And I'm very grateful that this is much better than the meeting they had in Marina, where we had to sit and listen to people talk for an hour. I really like this better. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so um, there's a hand up. Jan. I have a, a quick housing story. <coughs> So a senior housing story. Senior. In my day job, I work for a nonprofit called Mid Penn Housing, and we're building 19 units of affordable senior rental housing in Monterey, right behind the police station. We have over a thousand seniors on the list for 19 affordable homes. That's a heartbreaker right there. It took a decade to actually come to fruition. Right. So thank you for sharing both both of you. And another share is, is in terms of, of renting and, and workforce, right? So the vast majority of our workforce are people that are, you know, especially here on the, in the peninsula in our region, hospitality, ag, 
two biggest employers, right? Aside from the county and the city government. And so um, maybe someone has a, a rental story, particularly about what, what the rents have done in the last few years. Um, we're going to take the corner over here. Uh, yes, uh, well, my story is um, I moved. I, I moved here both from Monterey originally, but I moved away a couple of years, well, 20 years ago. When I decided to come back seven years ago, um, I thought it was going to be back when my parents raised seven of us children, one income. We were able to have a house and everything was good. When I came here, I realized that even though I don't, you know, I don't work in McDonald's or anything like that, I work for a purse, a large purse company. I'm a translator. Um, I also have side jobs, yet I cannot afford a two-bedroom house to bring my children in, to bring my two daughters in. I have been having to move for the past seven years, every single year. The first year that I moved, um, because of my credit and I lost my properties and my business in 2008, uh, because of my credit, they requested, the management company requested that I give the largest deposit, which was close to $3,000 deposit plus the first month's rent. Um, I had to live with my daughters for three months to, I'm sorry, you know, be equal to be able to come up with money and bring my daughters into a decent two-bedroom apartment. When I did, the following year, um, they raised the rent with almost $200, which was very difficult for me to pay, so I had to move. And every single time, I had to downsize from a two-bedroom to a one-bedroom to a studio. So um, right now, I'm in a two-bedroom, but I am sharing rent with a family member. So it has just been really hard. Uh, because no matter how many hours I work, I can still not make enough to make, you know, to at least say I can rest for a day in a week. I'm always working 120 hours a week, so I can make it. $1,600 is a lot of money for me to pay, plus, you know, what I help with, which will be more dollars. So I don't get any government assistance, never have, never will, I hope. But I've been trying really hard that with my income, I can at least pay for my rent. That's all I've ever asked for. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for being here. It's important for us to hear these kind of things. What do we hear about right now? Overcrowding, huge deposits, huge rents, availability. There's all these different things, and we're going to start uh, breaking some of those down in, in just a few minutes. Um, we wanted to spend a couple minutes here hearing about what Seaside is doing, and as, as cities and county governments are required to do a certain amount of, of uh, housing work, and, and there's staff that are dedicated to that in each, each jurisdiction. So we want to hear from Kurt in terms of some of the major activities that, that are happening and being planned right now in the city of Seaside. So Kurt, please. Well, I want to start off by saying I'm not the guy that does housing. And I've told Matt this about a million times that I'm, I'm very uncomfortable speaking about this, pro this policy set because it's not my expertise. But with that being said, there are some kind of obvious things, right? We've got more people want to live here than there are houses for people to move into. That's kind of obvious. We have a lot of jobs that don't pay well. And that, because of the pressure of supply and demand, when you have incomes that are low, housing prices that are high, something's going to have to get one way or another. And that's kind of where we're at. And as a city, you know, there are people we need to hire, including someone to help us with housing policy. And it's very difficult to hire someone just because of sticker shock of what it costs. Even if we hire somebody who's really good in the Central Valley, when they come to the Central Coast, it's sort of mind-blowing difference in housing price. Um, and just to give you an idea, I'm moving into a 1,300 square foot house. I'm not going to tell you how much it costs. But it's a lot more than my dad's house in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that he told me the other night that he thinks maybe, maybe if the market was on a really good day, he could get $230,000 for 4,000 square feet. Um, and, and part of what he pays for with his $230,000 is they mow his lawn and take care of everything for him. So, you know, just to give you an idea of how wildly off the rest of the United States we are in housing prices, it's pretty wild. So, what we are trying to do, number one, though, is we're trying to affect this law. So we have a project we've been working on. Some of the people in this room I recognize from the shreds that we did, um, called Campus Town. And what Campus Town is is an area that was formerly Fort Ward, um, 
heavily impacted by the Army. There, there's virtually not an inch of that dirt that wasn't impacted by some kind of structure at some point in time, um, including some of the most difficult to demolish structures and on all of Fort Ord, but the buildings that we call hammerheads. Um, they're these right here, and actually the project is a little bit further, but these buildings here uh, cost over a million dollars each to tear down because they have what's called tenacious asbestos. So another thing that we should talk about in housing price in California, it includes things like the risk pricing for sequel lawsuits. It includes development impact fees, which really were created so that city governments could fill the hole created by Prop 13. So you got some other pressures on price that go beyond, you know, here costs about $130 a square foot building a new stick frame construction house. Costs the same in Atlanta, costs the same in Indianapolis, costs the same in Davenport, Iowa, costs the same in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But that same house in Grand Rapids, Michigan will be a third or less of the cost of a brand new house in the central coast of California. And part of that pricing difference is risk pricing, we have some other things legally, like uh, for instance, condominiums are very hard to build in California because the developer can be sued for 10 years after they build it for developer defects and there are lawyers that all they do is they convince homeowners association to sue the developer and it ends up on the back of the homeowners, they don't know it's coming, that's what ends up happening. Um, so, like I said, very complicated net of things that are, are helping us not be affordable. Um, so here, here is a, gee, what version are we on? This is the almost completed version of the site plan. And you'll see everywhere that you see something that's red, it's mixed use, which meaning either housing or office above uh, retail. Um, along here, all this yellow that you see, those are townhouses. Uh, the purple that you see is student housing. And this is an older plan, uh, so it still has a lot of things on it that aren't on the new plan. Um, we, we've significantly improved this plan. It's got better connectivity. It's a much more new urbanist design. Uh, but we're talking about 1,450 units total is the maximum that this development will be able to deliver. Of that, about 450 units will be student housing. The rest will be a mix of townhomes, single-family homes, and, and multifamily. Um, of all of this, we have to, by city ordinance, either um, extract an in-lieu fee roughly equivalent to the building of one unit, which is not what we want to do, and I'll explain why in a second, or we have to force the developer to fill 20% of their units at an affordable level, which is what the developer is planning on doing. The reason we don't like the in-lieu fee is, number one, it turns the city into developers, and that's not really what we do, and, and nor is it what we should do. We'll make mistakes that'll cost a lot of money and we shouldn't be doing it. The other reason is that you want to be, you, you want to not segregate your land uses or segregate your income levels. People that are in poverty do better when they live, live next to people that are not. Um, people that are not in poverty are more empathetic to people who are, if those are their neighbors. So we don't want those things to get, you know, where we build a, uh, an old HUD-style housing development from the 1960s. Yet, as we know, those pretty much universally failed, failed to provide safe, quality, affordable housing for people, and failed to help those folks that, that moved in there to rise out of poverty. So we want to use a little bit better method than that. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, Mangate. Also, another, I remember, um, you said that 6,020 6,200 units, right? So we'll exceed the cap in this project. And the only reason that we won't really exceed the cap is because we're working very hard to figure out how to make the student housing not be subject to the cap. Um, this is the old plan. It was 669,000 square feet of commercial retail um, with a rather large hotel, uh, 250 key hotel. <coughs> and some other ancillary uses. Well, and you'll notice that probably two thirds of the site coverage is parking. I imagine how much traffic impact two thirds of the site covered with parking is going to create. 
Well, nobody builds these things anymore. They're called life style centers. If you were to take this and look at a Google aerial of the Irvine spectrum down in Irvine, California, surprisingly enough, it looks exactly like this. It's turned a little bit, but it's exactly the same project. Nobody builds those anymore. So we have a developer, his name is Paul Petrovich, and we're working on, again, a new urbanist mixed use project. It'll be anchored by a grocery store. We know that so far. Um, we're going to have some of those hotel rooms, probably not all of them. Um, and then between student housing, townhomes, and singles, and market rate affordable, or market rate uh, multifamily, about uh, 1,050 units total. Um, and again, you know, putting students in student housing takes pressure off of our most inexpensive market. So that's uh, something we think is really important to do. Uh, the last question I want to talk about is the nurses' barracks. So if you guys have ever had the occasion to hang out next to the great big DOD building with the cool big fence around it, right behind that are two buildings that currently are, I think there's probably 20 raccoons that live in there. I know there's some other critters that live in there. And, and our, our college and high school students uh, think it's a place to go have big parties. If you, you would be appalled at the things that you see walking through there. It's a little shocking. Um, anyway, a uh, local developer named Alf Lover is working on uh, redeveloping this into 40 uh, market rate uh, workforce type housing. Uh, this is a rather difficult project. It's got some environmental impacts that need to be cleaned up. Uh, we don't own the property because of the parcel that it's on also happens to contain where all of the forest staging area was. So I don't know if any of you uh, gentlemen in this room remember being a 19-year-old boy. Um, I do, but barely. But 19-year-old boy lugging a crate of hand grenades or 20-millimeter shells, and sergeant's not looking, and there's a tree over here and a hole from a wood rat. So there was a lot of stuff that went boom out there. So all of that's been cleaned up. But we have to wait on the regulatory agents, agencies to sign off on the cleanup, make sure that everything was done properly. Because you know, the last thing we want is for some little kid to be riding their bike out there and run over a hand grenade and get blown up. That would be not good, right? So we're waiting for the the army for uh, the California Department of Toxic Substances and the EPA to sign off on this, and then the project is started. Can I just ask you? You said market rate. Slash workforce. Yes. Kind of like an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sort of. If you can construct things inexpensively enough, you can actually have affordable rents by the way that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say like Indianapolis affordable, but Central Coast of California affordable rents without actually having to, to force deed restrictions or anything onto the project. And that's what the developer intends to do. So uh, three bedroom in this will go for about 1,900, and two bedroom for about 1,400, which is significantly below the existing market. Excuse me. So we're gonna have like just a couple more questions. We want to I gotta let I gotta let Jane go first because she's a supervisor. Jane's question. Uh, a quick question. <laughs> talking about these uh, developments on Fort Ord, and those are you know, larger numbers, but as part of the. Uh, Re revitalization of Broadway, Did, are there some uh, housing uh, mixed-use things happening there? If I could, I, will, I, I literally have uh, about 40 developers ready to pull the trigger on development. I have people actively trying to assemble properties along there. There's a little bit of a problem now. All of Broadway is subject to the cease and desist order with Calam, and there's no water, no developers doing anything until they know they can get water entitlements. So. Until we solve the water problem, I don't think there's a way to make that happen. So they have some water, but not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I have a question. Um, all of the housing that's being built at Monterey County at, on Fort Ord is way, way past any kind of affordability, low income. We're talking about the people who live here also, the people that live in these communities. Uh, and you're talking about uh, market rate and property workforce investment and uh, the thing about it is where are the jobs and, and, and for the workforce <coughs> unless you're talking about the workforce of the people that already can afford to live in these units we're talking about people who 
can't afford to live in the kind of units you're talking about. So this is just not clear what you're doing. Well, again, 20 percent of all the units that we create have to be affordable. Yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> now that's what we do. It don't turn out that way. That, that's what we do, we, and we, we will do that. Right? So we're, all, we're all hearing that, that no, we're going to 20%, right, for, for four, yeah, these four, four, four sites, so we're, we're going to hold them accountable. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. We do want to move forward, move forward here. One last, one more thing. We will be, and, and this one, I'm looking right at you, Jane. Um, we, we are in the process of working with county staff um, to create what's kind of a, the replacement tool for redevelopment so that we can use tax government financing to fund affordable housing. Uh, right now, we, the state really took away all of our affordable housing tools when they ended redevelopment. Like the, even the Cow Home Grant, which was a first time home buyers program that you could you know, get a grant from the state of California and then administer a first time home buyer kind of silent second loan pro project where you de-restrict the house and you use silent second to down pay for down payment from the city. They, they took almost all the funds from that too. So we're working on what's called a community revitalization and investment authority. Uh, what a community revitalization and investment authority does is it takes the increment in taxes. So when we build these, these three projects that I just talked about, plus a couple more, the difference between the property taxes on those pieces of dirt now and the property taxes after stuff gets built goes to its own special revenue fund. And then we can use that to bond against and do other things without having to go through all of the voter approvals for bonds, without doing some of those other things. And we have to devote 25% of every penny that that district gets. And every bit of money that we spend to affordable housing. So if we can get that tool, and if we can get some kind of participation in that, we are going to be in a much better position to help create affordable housing. And I, I know I, I've talked to Dave Spar and to Andal Lou, and we're, we're working through some details, and we're going to be meeting with you hopefully in the next few weeks about this. See, see, what, see what that program is again? So Community Revitalization and Investment Authority. And, and uh, we're going to be hearing that. And James Conport, part of Luis, was the author of the bill that created them, so I'm hopeful I at least got two votes. <laughs> we're going to go on to I'm sorry, we're going to we're gonna have to okay. move, move on. We want to thank Kurt for, he said he's not the housing guy, but he did pretty good. Okay. So thank you very much. And hold on to those questions at, at the end. If, if um, we can't get to them, then, then we'll, we'll do our best to try to address those. So just zooming through here, so you've heard it a little bit before, Modern Day Economic Partnership. That's right our region for all residents. That's our vision. Our mission is simply to improve the economic health and quality of life across the region. Um, lots of values here. Draw your attention to triple bottom line. We're talking about the economy, improving the economy, the three E's, economics, it's about the environment and equity. And I stress equity because that's why I work for MBAP. Okay? Um, we, um, <laughs> that's why I'm here tonight because I believe strongly and I've heard from a lot of the major employers across the region who are members here that they want to do something about housing. Not necessarily sure what to do, um, but they want to do something. They have to do something because their economic interests are at stake, right? As well as ours, as well as the whole region. Um, our board of directors, a couple of notes for uh, nearby, you have the president, CSUMB is on our board, uh, you see the city manager, Salinas, you have the president of Monterey uh, County Business Council, so you have a mix of, of public, private folks that are part of our board, very engaged folks um, there. So our strategies, uh, workforce development, build a tech ecosystem, and housing, and um, we want to advocate for and support creation of retention of new jobs and businesses and be a go-to source for Tri-County data, I invite you to go to our website to learn a lot about uh, what's going on across the region. Follow us on, on Twitter and Facebook and you get, again, some of the, the data that, that you might need for, for your information. So real quick, the housing strategy is three things. Advocacy around policy and projects. This is advocacy as well, building a network of invested, interested, informed housing advocates so that we can show up to the planning commission meetings, to the council meetings, when there's policies and projects coming up, not only just in our neighborhood, but across the region. We gotta show up. We have to understand what's going on, and we have to make sure our voices are heard, that the right kind of developments get done to meet the needs that we all were just hearing about earlier. Monterey Bay Housing Trust Fund, we actually built a housing trust uh, 
um, of the $13.2 million in partnership with the Housing Trust Silicon Valley. So we brought a new resource to the region. It's loans for uh, low-income housing across the region. We've done three loans so far. We'll talk about that in the future, but I want to get through this because we're running out of time and want to get to some other stuff. Um, so in terms of the Housing Trust, yeah, we had a little party. It was great. Uh, uh, Jimmy Panetta was there. There's, the, there's his, his slide, so yeah. <laughs> There's, there's all of our investors there. Some of you will, will make note of, of some of them. Packer Foundation, and way and many others. Employer-sponsored housing. You've probably heard about the Tannemary Antle project in, in Spreckles. Lots of hay about that. How it's going to destroy the quality of life in Spreckles residents. Now you can hear Pete. In fact, it's improved things over there. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that, that we push forward and we try to hold our friends and our business leaders accountable to doing what they can around affordable housing. And uh, another one that just recently broke ground right adjacent to Salinas is that was an 800 bed facility here um, that's now housing over 500 uh, uh, workers, mostly domestic folks that are feeding us. And um, Casa Baranda from uh, Foxy Produce, the Nunez family, they broke ground recently um, on 600 bed facility. So you can tell that um, they're getting serious about meeting the needs of the ag industry. So in terms of other projects, there's several other in industry leaders that are talking about it. I'll mention the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. I'm in very serious discussions in supporting um, uh, PK, uh, their superintendent, Nittenbaugh, and others. They're very serious about moving forward at some point soon, hopefully on activating a couple sites. There's actually decreasing enrollment, so that means that they're looking at some sites that might be opportunities for housing in either potentially Marina or even Seaside. So stay tuned on that one. But that's employer-sponsored housing. Again, the major employers actually stepping up. We're tracking that and moving it forward, but we need your support. Um, so I want to ask John to, to come up because he's going to go through these slides. We want, we want to get, get through them and just kind of Wet the appetite a little bit and, and uh, move forward, but certainly if folks have a burning desire to understand particular slides, then we can do that. So, security and housing, like I talked about with my personal housing story, that opens the door to being participatory in all of the amenities that our cities offer, like being able to go to the parks, being able to access transit, uh, having shopping nearby, being able to vote, but also participating in those things is how we make housing security a reality for everybody. So it's a two-way street, uh, a positive feedback loop. Some of the things that building affordable housing does, you can read the list. I mean, it creates jobs, it creates housing, it creates new tax revenue, it gives people a place to live, it strengthens communities. Of course you have environmental impacts you need to be concerned about, but like Kurt mentioned, there's a, a law, the California Environmental Quality Act, and no project gets built without being approved from various legal bodies by uh, a CEQA process. So if you get signed off on the CEQA, housing makes communities better. More housing means more people are more secure. So the three A's of housing are affordability, adequacy, and availability. If no houses are affordable, it doesn't matter if the entire city is vacant. If every house is available and nobody can afford to buy one, not a lot of greatness. If the housing is substandard, it doesn't matter whether you can afford it because you can't stay there. And if the housing is substandard, it doesn't matter if it's there because you don't want to move there. So you have to have all three of these things in order for housing to be attractive for they, so that people want to stay there and can stay there. Uh, affordability is a technical term, it's a legal term. 30% of your income is the threshold for what an affordable home might be. So. That number has actually increased over time. It used to be 25% uh, until the 80s, but Congress decided to change that because housing just got so darn expensive. Uh, whether you are talking about uh, homes on federal property or homes in a city or an unincorporated city, it's all the same number, 30%. Uh, many families in California, especially here on the Monterey Peninsula, uh, Monterey County, including Salinas and the unincorporated areas nearby, are burdened in their housing costs and they end up paying more than 30% for their housing. Uh, 30 to 50 percent. Uh, 31, excuse me. 31 to 50 percent. Um, and anybody who is paying more than half of their income for housing is extremely cost burdened. And I think a lot of us remember back when the market took a dive. 
Uh, a lot of folks were hanging on by the skin of their teeth and they were paying entire paychecks just to stay in their homes. So if 50% is extreme, I don't know what 80 or 90 or 100% is. Um, but here on the peninsula, as Matt and Kurt talked about earlier, we absolutely know what it's like to have a burden in our housing costs. And I would be surprised if you knew more than a handful of people who were below 30% of their income um, that goes toward housing. So how do we get to that 30% number? What does that mean? Um, it's on our area median income. And that's the Salinas M uh, MSA, the, the metropolitan area. Um, so for the county of Monterey, the average median income for a family of four is $81,400. So that sounds like a lot of money. Uh, $81,000 when I was uh, freshly out of high school and trying to figure out what job I want, what, what I would study in college, 81000 seemed like a fair number to me. Um, but if you factor in taxes, you factor in the cost of a car, insurance, daycare if you've got young kids or college expenses if you're paying for your older kid to go to school, and even if your kid's in public school, uh, like elementary or high school, you still have dances and sports and music food for your family, quickly $81,400 evaporates and now you're trying to struggle to balance everything um, and pay less than 30% of that money and have money left over for everything else. Um, moderate income is 81 to 120%, so that's where workforce housing comes in. Having uh, housing that's below market rate, so market rate's up here below market rates and anything underneath up to 120% where we get that moderate, above moderate income uh, and moderate income. So if you are in the moderate income category, you still cannot afford a market rate home because you're only making $100,000 a year. And I don't know if anybody's checked recent prices here on the peninsula, but in Seaside, two bedroom, one bath homes are going for five, $600,000 a piece. I have no idea what the city grows, Delray Oaks, Carmel, it's just, if you're, if you're at moderate income or above moderate income, you're in the same boat as everybody else. Um, so low income is 65,120. Oh, pardon me. Is 65,120. That's probably a more realistic threshold for a lot of people who are either young professionals or multiple income uh, service and hospitality based families. Um, maybe uh, a, a newer teacher or um, a firefighter or a police officer at a smaller department that doesn't have a lot of tax revenue to pay people enough to live in their communities. Um, or if you're working several service jobs or your family has multiple service jobs. And then extreme, or sorry, very low income is at 31 to 50, which is only half of the median income. So imagine having $40,000 a year, paying roughly $13,000 a year in, uh, in rent. Well, 13,000 divided by 12 is a little more than 1,000 a month, 1,000, uh, oh, less than 1,100 a month. Where do you know you can find right here on the peninsula or even Salinas for 1,100 a month? Now let's drop that even further down to extremely low income, we're at under 30%. I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who pays six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month for rent and has any kind of security in their housing. John? And a reminder, that's for a family of four. That's or not family of four. Family of four. Family of four. Family of four. So if you go, if you decrease that number to go to a family of one or a family of two, all of these numbers drop considerably, and our whole conversation has to change. So we're going to probably jam through a bunch of the other ones just because you know. Um, so first off, I just want to mention we did set it for seven, but we got about 15 minutes late start because we wanted to kind of settle in. Is everybody okay with the go 15 minutes and use that as kind of like a new dish, like brunch? Yes. Uh, I want to respect everybody's time. But if it's time for 7.15, that, that's okay? Okay, good. I'm hearing consensus. Yeah. So we're going to, we still want to get through a lot of slides because we want to engage a little bit. But go back one more time because I think this deserves a little bit of attention. This, this is probably, probably the most important slide in our whole presentation. Because as you move forward and engage in the affordable housing space, these percentages come up all the time. Campus town. When those rent thresholds are, are set by the developer and in conjunction with, with the city, when, when that process goes through and that deal gets cut, where are those thresholds going to be set? We said 20%, but 20% of those units, and then how does that get allocated? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where 
that is it pres is it prescribed for it? It is a third medium, a third moderate, and a third a third one. Okay, so a third, a third, a third, yeah. right? So there's there's the answer to that question. Is that is that enough? Is that the deal? Is there whatever? So I'm I'm leaving that there for a second, but but it's going to come up over and over again. So to remember understanding how these. Uh, thresholds work is just really important in, in, in uh, for sake of being an uh, advocate. So we want to get through the next five. We don't want to. We don't even know the issues are, are really dire, so we don't have to uh, admire the problems. So the, the, the blue line, line here that peaks and is at the top. That's moderate money home prices. Seaside is the orange line. As you can see, Seaside keeps pace with the rest of Monterey County on average, which is significantly higher than the purple line, which is the median price across the United States. Uh, again, Seaside, Monterey County, California, are for median rents, $2,300 a month, uh, far exceeds what median affordability is. And the U.S., a little more than half of that. So you can tell, I mean, you live in every day, we all live in, uh, those of us that rent, we know that our rent here is astronomically higher than anywhere else. Yeah. And this is data that confirms the suspicion. Uh, 15% of the families in Monterey County can afford the median price of housing here. So if the, so 16% of, house, of households all across the U.S., um, they're able to afford what the median housing price is in their communities. Only 15% of folks in our county can do that. So roughly one in eight families can afford what the median price for rent is. These are some uh, breakdowns of what the average pay, the average income is for various jobs. We all know that doctors make a lot of money, but even them, at just under 100000 for the average physician, if 30% of your income is supposed to be, more, no more than 30% is supposed to be for housing, that's $30,000 a year or $2,500 a month. So $2,500 sounds like a good amount for rent, but if you only have, if you've got four, I'm uh, sorry, two children, and again, we go back to the earlier slide. Rent, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, a car payment, insurance, gas, cell phones for your kids so that they can't make it home from school. You can figure out where they are. Sports, college uh, savings, 529. $100,000 doesn't go very far. And so if you're not a doctor, if you happen to work in building and grounds maintenance and you make less than half of that, how are you supposed to afford it if a doctor can't afford it? So the Median income tied to income levels of various professions is listed here. And in order for people to be able to afford rent at that 30% threshold, they would need to make the money in rent. Is that correct, Mike? Did I read that slide correctly? So the, they make the blue, the blue uh, is what they make. Right. Right? And red is income, the blue is the threshold of 30%, and it's lower than the median market rate rental, the 2100. That's where that's what would that's where it should be at the top. You see that one? The yes. One? So if you made 5580 a year, you would need to spend no more than 1674 right. for your rent to be affordable in that 30% bracket. However, the median rent in Monterey County is twenty-one seventy-six. So even if you made close to fifty-six hundred bucks a month in rent, you still are five hundred dollars a month short in rent to pay the median price of housing in Monterey County. So fifty-six hundred is about seventy-five thousand a year, seventy-eight thousand a year. You are still five hundred dollars a month short to pay the affordable or the median housing cost. Okay. I think isn't part of that like if you go back to the website, like as you go down in the jobs, like yeah, the the gap is becomes even shorter. Right. Right. So <coughs> if I were in retail and I made twenty six hundred bucks a month, uh, thirty percent for me would be seven ninety seven. That's how much I could afford to pay in rent. And if the average the median rent is twenty one seventy six, I'm thirteen hundred dollars away from what the median price of rent is in the modern county. So. For very high paying jobs, like public administrators and doctors, they're short. So for the most impacted people, their affordability range is significantly lower, but it's still way beyond reach for the, those of us who have great paying jobs and benefits and 
um, second, a partner or a second family member that's also contributing to our housing costs. Generally speaking, the takeaway from this slide is most people can't afford to pay rent in Laurie County compared to what that 30% threshold designates per income level. So uh, several people have hit on uh, Fort Org and how there's a lot to clean up out there and how we need to make the housing safe and how we need to secure it to make sure that there's no accidents in the future. So housing adequacy is a huge issue. Um, people have talked about uh, potentially just tearing down the buildings and building new structures on Fort Ord, but you get into problems of, uh, I forget the name of the, the material, but the piping. That's, 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 that's a different one. Like that. Oh, PCB. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of, there's, there's, a, there's, it, there's a half dozen or a dozen different types of. Each, each board and now those wooden barracks buildings that you're looking at right there have about a pound and a half of lead in them. <laughs> so in the back, you couldn't hear each board has a pound and a half of lead in the paint. So no one's going to tear that down with the environmental hazard that is lead, and then just build something right on top and say go for it. So you have to excavate dirt, you have to ship it to a hazardous materials uh, cleaning site. That costs money, which the developer's going to pass on to us as future renters and buyers, because they've got to stay solvent, otherwise they can't afford to do it. There's some wiggle room in there, so I don't mean to sound like I'm making excuses for them, but certainly that's a cost that gets factored into how much we pay. Um, 19%, according to the draft general plan for the CSC site, 19% of our homes are overcrowded, meaning that one out of five houses, there's more people in each room or more families in each house that belong there to have uh, safety, privacy, and adequacy of services. So just because it's available doesn't mean it's adequate. Um, and then, of course, the substandard conditions. If you live in a house and you pay $300 a month rent, you share that house with a couple of people, it's a nice spot, but your stove doesn't work. That doesn't do you a whole lot of good because now the money that you're not paying rent, you're paying to eat out because you can't keep anything. So there are a lot of moving pieces to making sure that housing is available, affordable, and adequate. And part of what MBEF does is to advocate for that and help cities and counties um, develop those sites. So Kurt alluded to supply and demand. Um, if you have more houses than people need, they become less valuable because nobody's using them. If you have less houses than people need, they go up in price because they're scarce, um, generally speaking. Um, in Monterey County, do you guys think that there is an equilibrium where we have an equal balance, or do you think that there's a mismatch somewhere? I mean, yeah. The reason why we're here is because nobody understands, well, not understands, nobody can individually move the needle on why housing is so out of control here. And so together, thank you to MBEP, thank you to the County of Monterey, thank you to the City of Seaside, and all of our community partners. We need to work together to make housing adequacy, availability, and affordability a priority. When we all are going to do that together, it's not disparate needs all pushing in different directions. Together, we're going to uh, make a change. Oh, also just a quick note here on the vacancy rate here listed at the bottom. Sure. Um, in the city of Seaside, that draft general plan, 4.6%, uh, I think it says, maybe 4.8% of all the rental units available in Seaside are available. Um, so one in 20 places for rent in Seaside you could rent today. The for sale vacancy rate is less than 1%. So of all the houses that you could live in in Seaside, no more than 1% is for sale at any given time. So, yes, there is a disequilibrium. There is not enough available for the need that we have. So the quick thing on that is we have a couple of affordable housing developers in the room. I know Jan mentioned earlier, but um, it, uh, it, we have Jay Hart with those community houses. Do you want to say something about uh, the waiting list that you have here in the region? Yeah, um, I, I don't know about the region. Uh, Eden is about 15 counties in California, and we have uh, Orange County, Orange County, properties. We uh, probably house, I don't know, how many families we have? 20,000, I don't know how many best families or individuals, but our waiting list is 22,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Our waiting list is 22,000 people. So once you open a new project, you put all the people in, you put all the people in uh, 60 units, but you still have another 300 on the waiting list. No one really leaves those apartments unless they move away. So the waiting list just doesn't move very quickly. And, uh, that's that's backlog. We don't have to go 
So there's a tool that regional groups, uh, so AMAC, the Association of Monterey, Monterey Bay Area Governments, is uh, Monterey, yes? Why aren't we building modular houses? Why aren't we using more mobile housing? Why aren't we building tiny houses? We, we aren't building them fast enough for the supply, for the need. And there's got to be some more thought on how to do that. Thank you for that. Hold on, we're going to come back to that because that, that's kind of, thank you. But that's, that's kind of near the end when we, when we start to kind of categorize next steps. That's exactly what, what we'll talk about. So uh, on this one, you want to highlight like the, the two, two of your big numbers and then move to the next one. Yeah, so head back, Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties, they all come together with a regional housing needs allocation. How many houses are, I'm sorry, homes, how many homes do we need to build in our region? Monterey County is supposed to build almost 1,800 very low income, 1,160 low income, 1,300 moderate, 3,099 above moderate. So we need almost 7,400 homes in Monterey County alone through 2023 to keep pace with the housing needs, not to recover from 1969 when we first started doing these. In CSR, the Monterey Bay region, including the other two counties, 12,600 homes. So we need 12,624 homes just to address today, but not the historical last 50 years. Can I, I, I just add a statistic on that. We're behind about a million eight houses in California, a million eight hundred thousand houses, and, and we're only building about a hundred thousand a year. So it's, it's gonna, you know. It's so much years. like her list never shrinks, yeah, our years, arena, our, our regional housing needs will never shrink unless we quickly ramp up and start taking bites out of that apple. Uh, so in Seaside, we are required, not required, uh, it's suggested that we build 393 homes to keep pace with the regional housing needs. Uh, so that's spread out between 94 very low, 62 low, 72 moderate, and 164 above moderate. Um, some of that's been addressed through a new senior living uh, home that's going to go in by the shop um, on Co. Um, some of that is other local projects. We recently refinanced, we the city of Seaside recently refinanced some affordable housing um, in the middle of town, big, uh, big affordable housing area. So our need today, we have not yet met our very low income housing uh, threshold, 95, we still need those. We still need all 62 low income. But in the moderate category, we've actually tackled 70 of what we're supposed to be building. And for the above moderate, we've done all but seven. So, as you might have guessed, the houses that we did build did not go toward the low income and very low income, which is not the fault of the city. We need more developers to build those homes. And I know for a fact that that's part of what Kurt's working on when he's talking to the developers about Campus Town, Nurses Barracks, Bay Gate, and some of the other projects going on in town. So, I'll just real quick, and then we can skip to my first side, but can you go back real quick? So everybody kind of commit to memory 393. Okay, so 393 is your number. Okay. Seaside. Three, what is the number? 393. What does it mean? Sorry, hold on. What's the number 393, right? 393. So 393 is the number. It gets broken down into all these categories. But raise your hand if you think that that's the, the true need. Do you think it's, do you think it's higher than that? Yeah. Or lower? Yeah. Yeah. So the state gets that too, right? So back, back to your point. They, they have to use some kind of number, there's some kind of metric. So they go through this crazy process called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. No one really agrees with the whole process, but it's the best thing we got. So that's the goal. And then each jurisdiction, the city, the county, everybody across the whole state needs to plan for that. Otherwise you get in trouble. It's called a, a housing element out of compliance and you don't get, you know, some of the bells and whistles, you don't get access to funding, you could be sued pretty easily if, if, if you have that situation. There's set, several jurisdictions that are dealing with that. So we don't want to, to have that, but we, we want to, and I think Kurt agrees, we're going to be okay in terms of the planning for that, but then will it actually get done? So, so the state number is only on the estimated population increase in that period of time. They're not looking at what the current need is now. Right. The so the need supply. can be double, triple, or whatever. This is, this is basically kind of a, getting a D. So 393 is getting a D. You can pass with that, but, right? I think we want to be A, a B students, right? Um, so Kurt, do you want to take it? It's also important to understand that from the developer's perspective, and it's true, a moderate unit 
as a break even unit. A low unit they're going to lose somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. Very low, low unit they can lose 50 percent of just the cost of constructing and building that house. So the rest of that has to be made up somewhere else within the development or nothing happens. Right, so we don't want, good point, we don't want 100% of zero. So I'll come back back to here. I just want to make sure we understand that. We'll go real quick. We're going to skip that one because we know we're not getting there. I'm going to mention the access tools and we'll spend a few minutes kind of categorizing them. We'll come back over here in the corner. Okay, I'll start with you, sir, in just a minute. Um, but advocacy tools, so MBEP in terms of, of where our membership money goes and where our advocacy tools go, we said, okay, well, what, do, what do you guys want us to do? Well, we had heard that, hey, if, um, if we had somewhere to go um, in terms of a calendar, who's, who's tracking all the day meetings across the whole region? Well, we track some of them, not everything, but we have a calendar. So if you go to our website, you can find out uh, we have an intern and other people. And you know, uh, where's Amelia? Amelia, thank you very much for uh, updating the, the calendar. So that's available. We track 20 units or larger, right? So not every single project that's happening, but some of the larger ones across the region, we track on a regional housing pipeline map. So you can look to our website for that as well. We also have an action center where if we work together and if, if there's uh, alignment with, with our mission and our goals of, of creating more supply, um, we could actually load up a campaign and actually help on a specific project that the community decides it wants to get done, or maybe even a policy. To illustrate, we had the Santa Cruz downtown recovery plan that nobody thought was ever going to happen because there was so much dissension. After a period of about a year, last year, I spent a lot of time and effort, we pulled it together and it ended up not having as many fireworks at the council that everybody thought and it ended up passing. And that's going to create about up to 800 different units in the downtown corridor when, and activate um, some sites down there. So that was an example of where we had about 40 or 50 um, people sending in letters through this mechanism and it really makes a difference. Council members and board of supervisors, raise your hand if it matters that you get letters from business leaders when you're considering an item. That means something. And now we can all sign up online there. And you can all sign up online. We'll reach out to folks. Again, the, this is what the interface looks like. We would load, work with folks to load in and have a ready-made uh, campaign. Right now, there's actually one happening tomorrow. Um, in the city of Monterey. Yes. You can actually go to our website right now and find out how to support that. It has to do with water allocations for mixed-use development in, uh, in Monterey. They all have a little bit of water, but um, where we're supporting there is mixed-use development that has both commercial and housing for the little bit of water allocations that they have. And some of the business leaders are saying, no, we just want it for commercial. So in terms of MVEP, because we're very clear about we want more both jobs and housing, we're supporting that effort. So stay tuned, we'll see you <coughs> tomorrow. But we have about a dozen to 15 folks that have already sent sign in letters as an example just in the last couple days. Um, at the database mapping, it spits out some really cool information, so that's there. So now we're pretty much near the end. There's two slides, and I'll show you real quick. So first one is sites. And we talked about that in terms of, of uh, you know, I want to thank Kurt because he was identifying a lot of times people say, okay, well, we'd love to do housing, but there's just no, there's no land, there's no, we're done, you know? It's kind of the same thing, and I, and I almost equate land with, with water at a certain level, right? You can't activate land unless you have all the infrastructure. You need access, you, you need infrastructure in terms of sanitation service, water, you know, all the things that, that make land possible to develop, right? So the key thing is sourcing sites. We have to have adequate sites. In a housing element, right, that we were saying before, that has, uh, you have to have plans to meet your arena goals, right? That, what's the number? We have to have a plan to get, make sure Kurt doesn't get go to jail, that he's got, that he's got a good plan. That is awesome. <laughs> okay? So keep him out, let's keep Kurt out of hot water and make sure that we have a plan that meets that and exceeds that, right? Um, but we have to have adequate sites. We have to have adequate sites that are properly zoned, that have that can actually move forward. So we look for housing element opportunity sites, redevelopment agency properties, which basically for our part is that. We have nonprofit developers. We have a couple in the room here today. They're constantly looking at potential sites, working with uh, you know, unconventional partners are down here. You got churches, school districts, I mentioned earlier before, hospitals are getting in the game. We've heard about the CHOM, 
recently acquiring some sites for their, their nurses and doctors. People heard about that, right? Yeah. Yes, on a previous slide. So there's some, yeah, there you go. Labor groups. There's labor. We miss labor group over here. You guys, you guys have either money or property. I know you do. You're hiding. I'm going to come get you. There may be non-profits. There may be non-profits out there that can source some sites, right? Um, there's, there's, we've got to think outside the box. We've got to work together on this. So the next thing is support policies. So you can see how it's, it's kind of coming together, right? We learned about how the numbers work, the need, the demand, we shared our stories. Now we're talking about we need to activate sites. The next thing is, okay, well, policy. You need policies that allow for those things to come together. Uh-oh, things are falling apart already. Um, so the first thing, um, what's the number one, what's the first thing on the list up there? Exclusionary housing ordinances. So that's... You know, depending on who you talk to, that's the best thing to slice bread, or it's the evil thing, whatever that you got to deal with. So uh, that's always a hot topic. You got higher density housing near transit services. We want to be able to have housing that's accessible, walkable potentially to parks, to education, to shopping, minimize the trips, reduce parking so that we can actually have. Who want? Who can live on a parking stall? Anybody? Yeah. Well, we're a lot of developers have to. Builds a lot more parking stalls than units sometimes, so we got to fix that. Now, real quick, sorry, can you explain? Is there any? Is there, is there any inclusionary housing that it, that actually exists? So, so yes. all of some that is inclusionary yeah. housing. That's it. Well, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there are. Right. So most of, most jurisdictions actually in the Monterey Bay actually have inclusionary housing policies. They're all they're all. Different and stuff. Mike, do you want to Yeah, I, I would say it exists, but it's not well tracked. Yeah. And a lot of the units, it's unclear if they are maintained in inclusionary housing. So that's one of the things we found. Yeah, so that, that's a great point. So, um, what makes something inclusionary? So, inclusionary, just real quick, a, a 30 second version of inclusionary housing, okay, is, is a policy at the local level. Okay, that requires new developers, new projects, to set aside a certain portion of their development for the and and for de restricted um, <coughs> units. And at the different levels that we were talking about, and then from there it gets interesting, right? Because it's like for units for who at what level. Well, it depends on the inclusionary housing or what period of time. And for what period of time? So some are 30, 15 years, 30 years, 45, 55. In perpetuity, there's just every policy is different, and that's where it gets super interesting because you want to be able to match the need, right? With with what? We had policy. a policy with the Melville that was written as it written legislation and everything else that have the kind of housing that we needed here when this base closed down, and it was all missed, messed up because, and you haven't said anything about housing for local people that already live here, and have already lived here, and have lost everything, and nobody's saying anything about that, it's not even being addressed. You're talking about a, something that's going to take 20 more years to get uh, right. So, so say that again. So you're so you're saying so now we're we're going into the last five or ten minutes of day of the meeting. We're going to identify. Thank you. We're going to identify now that now that we've all kind of again we we shared we learned a little bit. Maybe you learned something new. Hopefully, and we're now we're talking about where the rubber meets the road, right? The sites and the policies. Yeah. And so back to your point. So so you're saying something's missing. So so. Uh, so you're saying, so tell us again in your, in your own words, what, what in, in 10 seconds, what, what policy area, okay, because now we're going to talk generally about policy areas that, that we'd like to engage in, in terms of, and not just tomorrow, but long term. So you're saying, go ahead. We're turning into a gold rush. The Mellow Bill said that we needed low, very low income housing, affordable housing. That's what was supposed to be uh, set aside to bring back the economy when this base closed. Instead, we've got housing being built all over uh, Monterey County, even on Fort Ord. 
you're talking about 500,000, 600,000, 800,000, right on the same base where you're saying that there is uh, all this other stuff has to be done before we can build affordable housing, then how can we build all this other housing, expensive housing, on the same base that you're talking okay, about? Okay, so thank you for that. What I've written, <laughs> what I've written is, is four housing goals, question mark, well, right? Four, uh, Based on square footage. Okay, so now we, we're moving on to a different topic, which is uh, full. Well, J Jane? Housing on Jane? So, Jane? Oh, so, same kind of thing. It's, it's but it's, especially Fora, but maybe everywhere. But yeah, so that, that's, I guess, my point is that, um, so say that again? Uh, uh, developer fees based on square footage. Developer fees, well, so these are really like so fees that developers have to pay, impact right? Fees. So, impact so, fees. So, the point of that is right now, you might have the same developer fees because it's per unit, so it's a 5,000 square foot house would have the same developer fee as a 400 square foot studio. And if we can get it changed to per square foot, oh my goodness, oh, that's not this incentive. Does everybody get that? So, um, does everybody get that? Raise your hand if you want to talk about it for a second. So, yeah. Real quick, real quick. So the issue around um, how they set fees, okay, over here, is having an impact on what we actually get. This is happening across our whole region. And then we wonder why we get these huge, huge, huge you know, um, market rate apartments and huge McMansions still, yeah. right? It's a mismatch, yeah. right? So we, again, we have five or 10 more minutes, but the issue is that one of the major drivers for that are the impact fees that developers have to pay here, and then they have to try to recoup by paying higher rent, by charging higher rents, or selling at higher costs, okay? Because they do have to repay construction loans and make a certain amount of profit, all those different things, right? To a certain level, like, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> okay, but some of that plays, plays out on a, on a performance budget. So if you change this over here, in terms of how those, those um, fees are, are levied, they're not necessarily coming down a whole lot, but it changes the nature of what they design for and how many units they can build. Okay? Because if you set them on a per square footage basis, okay, instead of a per unit basis, so I'm being charged $40,000 per unit, okay, versus for a thousand, whether I'm building a, 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 a thousand square foot home or a 3,000 square foot home, I'm being charged $20,000 impact. So what do you, why would I ever build something that I can only charge less for? Or, or sell at a lower rate, right? So the date, so what Jane's saying, and what we actually have a policy paper we include, that's one of our nine recommendations for some of the city and county leaders across the region. We've said, look, we gotta change that dynamic, otherwise we're never gonna get out of this, this issue, and because the developers actually have a case here in terms of saying, hey, I have to recoup these costs, and we, so we have to make sure that's in alignment. So, okay, so new I question, wanna, new item? Yeah, well, I want to, um, off what she said and the, yeah. and the young lady back here who has lived here all her life from Monterey, is that we already have all these people here that can't afford the housing that's here. Um, when he talks about building on four doors, when we develop and develop and we don't really have the water for it, we keep developing and developing, that's, that's going to bring more people in. The majority of that housing, is, as we all know, if they build even 20%, which a lot of times, as she points out, they don't ever really build, but the majority of it is to bring in more people yes. to buy more $500,000, yes. $800,000 homes and bring in more people. It's not addressing issues of the people that have lived on the Monterey Peninsula all their lives and can't afford it. Now, when he talks about 20%, and, and there may not be a guarantee that you have 20% of apartments at $1,400 a piece, and then as I look at your chart, saying that the average, yeah. if you want to take the real average amount of people who live here, they work in the industries of agriculture and they work in tourism and they work, and they work, and they earn the 20,000 or less, um, they, they can't even by your own calculations afford his $1,400 apartment unless three families live together, which is, where which is not tax adequacy. So where, when are you going to talk about rent control? <laughs> so those are your first question, or your first point rather. Um, I'm not an attorney, and I haven't gotten a legal decision from the state of California, but I have contacted them, and the question I posed to them was, when a city or a county offers or, or seeks affordable housing to be built, 
how do we ensure that people who already live here have the first crack at that? Because yeah. it does no good to build the affordable units and everybody else gets a like, it's fair game. So, so when, because, you, when you build a preliminary housing that's affordable, each jurisdiction has the opportunity and almost always, in my experience, it is preference to people who live in that jurisdiction. So and, what I contacted is, the state about the state. was you yeah. can, bear with me when I use the word lottery because it's not really a lottery. You get one ticket if you live here. You get another ticket if you work here. You get another ticket if you live and work here. You get another ticket if you've got if you're a second generation person. You get another ticket if you're a third generation. And so we stack the deck for people who are already here, who already live and work here and have families here, by giving them ten tickets or points or chits or whatever number or word you want to use, so that when we have the drawing or we go down the list, you have 10 chances to get something that I've only got one chance for because I'm from the Bay Area and I work at Google and I've got more money than you do and so I'm going to be able to buy that house in cash as opposed to you having to make payments on the floor. But if we're just building out the peninsula, building it out, building it out, we don't have enough water, we don't have the traffic, and so that the peninsula that we So we know, so so we know. Right. So, so it sounds like there's a, a lot of consensus around this 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 theme, right? Around as we develop new opportunities, we want to make sure that there <coughs> these policies are then I'll be all we don't know for sure, but inclusionary, inclusive, right? They need to be inclusive. No, we don't want more development. I understand that, but guess what? We're not going to solve any problems. We we heard earlier, right? The overcrowding situation. One in five. People are, we know that there's existing need in this community for more housing. Where that gets built, how that, that gets built is up to us. But it seems like there's enough interest here that something has to happen, right? So, not, so neutrality or, or no new housing starts doesn't seem like that's an option. Right. Right. But Matt, one right. of the points that I think that we're trying to make is Let's not go with 20% or whatever it is. Let's talk about what are the income levels of our residents who need housing. And then figure out what the, how, what the prices are that they can afford. And figure out how to build those rather than rather than what they had. I think Cost in charge. Yes, I agree. We should do 20% market rate and 80% or 70% affordable, 10% workforce, and 20%. However, we need to cut the pie differently. And that comes down to pressure on our elected officials to create policies that reflect what we want in that we need more affordable and more and, and, uh, inclusionary workforce. So I don't want a 2010 policy of affordable and workforce. I want a 50-30 policy of affordable and workforce. And only 20% is left over. That is comes down to who you elect, it comes down to how they vote, and it comes down to who you vote for the next time when they don't do what you vote for them to do. But what do you they don't have these developers? I mean, they We're on the central coast of California. We have brownfields that are not yet developed. We have golf courses galore. We've got a lot of people. We've got a university right next door. How about that? How is that an incentive to a developer that needs to recoup his costs from what it costs to build his property here? Maybe right. we find a nonprofit developer instead of a for profit developer. So the, this, is, this is this is part of the, the hard part, right? Again, we're and we're pretty much done, okay, in terms of, of what we came here to do in terms of, of the presentation. So if you want to stay, I'm okay to stay for, for a few more minutes, but if you need to leave right now, you pretty much gotten what, what you came what we were offering so I expect that if you want to take a two minute break and those that need to leave leave and then if people can stay you say you want to do that I want to thank you everybody for thank you again
This discussion goes on before we reach the afternoon. Uh, if you want to stay for a few minutes, I will, but that's this is what I do. Yeah, you know, I'm really excited. There's a, a lot of energy, a good turnout. There was over 75 people here, and it was a mix of people from all over the peninsula. And you know, I heard from Salinas and, and other reports of the county really just are interested in this topic and invested in it. And, you know, we have to do something. We have to move forward with some meaningful policies and projects around housing to address our needs. And so I think that's what people are hungry for today. Yeah, so, so we, we wanted to make sure that uh, folks understood that we want to make a common partnership as a resource for them, for data, um, as, a, as a tool that they can use to engage in this public space around uh, increasing affordable housing. You really have to get active in understanding the projects that are coming up down the line and also the policies and what kind of implications they have.
personally and seriously, and I think Monterey has an opportunity tonight to do the right thing on mixed use housing, uh, uh, mixed use development and housing together. Tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, around 4.30 or 5 o'clock in Monterey. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you to everybody who came out tonight. Thank you to the city of Seaside. Uh, we had several folks here uh, in, in terms of, of uh, council members, uh, Kayla Jones and uh,